Welcome to Valiant Business, where we champion and equip freedom and faith-minded business leaders to fuel growth so they can make a measurable difference in their community and world. I'm Amy Alexander, the something focus are of growth strategists. I got there, guys. It's fine. Hi, guys. I'm David Mills. I am the artificially intelligent mad scientist of growth strategy. And I'm Chad Alexander. I am the dissenting voice of machine learning, the chaos theorist of growth strategists. I am the EM <laughs> Malcolm or whatever his name is from Jurassic Park in this discussion. Oh, I really hope there's a lot of stuttering coming up. Uh, 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 there may be. Excellent. So what is up with AI? The development of artificial intelligence, actually machine learning, has been simmering behind the scenes in big corporations for a lot of years now. The emergence of generative AI is the tipping point for public awareness about what these technologies can do. And when it comes to creating media for communications, branding, and online content, it's about to change everything. So today, we are talking about chat GPT and everything you need to know and how it's going to break everything. But before we dive in, you should know that we're a team of award-winning experts that build brands, websites, and content with real gravity. If you're a mission-minded leader that wants to catalyze transformation in your business and community, then hit that subscribe button, do it, and journey with us as we explore biblical leadership and practical lead-generating strategies. Do it now! Come on! Come on, the wood. Right, Are you so, some kind of wuss? What is this AI situation? Just someone go, because I feel well, very overwhelmed on. by this do, topic. Do we have a valiant or not today? Do we have a valiant or not? I guess we could say, is chat GPT valiant or not? And I think the answer is, we don't know yet. The, <laughs> the, the jury is out. The jury is out. I do have a response to that, but I think we need to dive into it before I give it. Sure. All right, so. here we go. So what is this this generative AI, artificial intelligence? Essentially, it's a bunch of algorithms. An example of that is chat GPT, which has blown up over the last month. And it can be used to create new content, including audio, code, images, text, simulations, and videos. It is a special branch, a special version of machine learning that creates complex output instead of just performing prediction or classification tasks. So it's outputting stuff, not just organizing stuff for you. And, you know, at its root, artificial intelligence is just a simulation of the way that human intelligence works. And it's done by computer systems. I think that the truth is that this has been this has been simmering and bubbling in the back room of big corporations. And we're seeing it. It's been bleeding out for a number of years into various applications until, ba-boom, chat GPT. And chat GPT gained over a million users within a week. They originally fed about 300 mm. billion words into the system. And just this week, I think Monday, Microsoft, they I think they previously had given a billion. Well, they just committed to another $10 billion. Um, the recent stats that we have right now are that ChatGPT has been used by over 500 million people worldwide. And the, the monthly estimate of traffic is... A lot, ninety-six million people a month. So it has exploded, and what's really happened here? It is. It's really the first large-scale AI service that the the public, to a large degree, has become aware of, which is why it has blown up. And if you've tried to get on in the last week or two, every time you go in, I'll say, "Sorry, we're busy. Sorry, we're busy." Well, that's because it's being hammered by a billion people a day trying to use it and learn it and explore it. And it is a it's honestly an AI explosion. I've seen news articles that call it a call it shock and awe. Um, it's a huge realization for many people. And so it's a really big deal. But you know what's what's what else is going on? And I'll I'll, I'll take a breath so you guys might want to say something before I keep going. Because I'm pretty hopped up on this stuff. Well, uh, I am hoping actually to include a demo in this just to give people some sense of it. Um, so I'm just going to get on there and keep refreshing through our podcast and see if I can get in. But if you've used anything like this before, like in our past, we've explored something called Jasper. Jasper is um, an AI tool that you can go in. You can ask it questions. You can um, have it 
you sort of like train this artificial intelligence around different topics that you need to write about. And over time, it gets a little better at it. Um, but it's still relatively rudimentary. What you get, what gets spit back out is has to be worked on a lot. It might replicate or duplicate the same con content over and over. We just found it to be a little bit arduous to use and it wasn't quite there. Um, chat GPT is like anything you've used like that on steroids. It is, it's the most intense experience. And it honestly freaked me out. Like we were playing with it one afternoon and I just left my office in a daze because the implications <laughs> of this kind of technology are truly frightening, like legitimately frightening. Um, we put stuff into it all the way from sort of um, industry standard questions about any kind of industry all the way to religious things like uh, Dave put something in there about like what are the largest things that biblical leaders are facing, largest um, challenges biblical leaders face today. And the answers it spit out were very good. I mean, it was good advice. It even on a different topic around branding, it spit out some of the same phrases and advice I had given in a podcast earlier that day. Uh, so it it's the closest I've seen to AI actually thinking. And of course, the implications for making our work faster and more efficient are huge. But there's also a lot of implications around like what kind of humanity is it going to take away? Who's going to get fired? What entire departments are going to no longer exist in five years? So you never experienced it. Go try it out. But we'll, we'll try for a demo. So I mean, let me just say, uh, Amy and I were in a meeting last week, and while we were in the meeting having a conversation, I was just on the side typing in questions related to branding for you know while we we're doing. It. So I just type a few questions in over the course of an hour, forty-five minutes, and and then the next morning I spent forty-five more minutes fleshing that out, and I ended up with um, the guts of eighteen blog articles in an hour. Now some of them were not very good. Some of them were kind of like. Wikipedia-ish kind of stuff, but other ones were actually 2,000 words long and were really quality. So, and they're not, none of them were done, I would say. They all need to be finessed and made interesting and add, you know, kind of the structure and headings and all that stuff. But I was blown away that with an hour investment, I could get that level and that much help toward a whole bunch of articles, right? So it's pretty dramatic. Um, it's, I think it's also important to say that it's not just chat GPT that's been dropping. It is other programs. Uh, last April, um, the same group that dropped chat GP put out a doll E2, which does text to image creation. I play with that today, actually, and made a bunch of interesting pictures. Some very dumb, um, but I'm not very good at it. Um, and then Google last year, um, had two two of its own images. I'm not sure they've been released yet. Imogen and Party. Um, and then also Mid Journey came out, which is a text to image model for artists. And then in August, Stable Diffusion is a UK startup re um, released um, through Stability AI as the company was released. And so essentially the whole the whole thing is blown up. Um, and it and so it's not just it's not just content, it's it's also graphics. Um, and then we also have um, we have video to text models that have come out from Google and Meta, and they're creating short video clips, animations, 3D pictures. Um, and you know, many people are aware of kind of the deep fake thing that's been happening, uh, in which people can actually put someone else's face on a video. Well, there's there's like a there's like a dozen different softwares that are doing that. Uh, you may have heard of Reface or Zao, Deep Face Lab, My Heritage, Wombo. There's a whole bunch of them. And on top of that, there's also a bunch of these AI programs that are writing code for people. And there's, uh, you know, um, OpenAI Codex is actually writing in 12 different programming languages, and they're using regular English instructions to write code. And so you can see that this is not a small deal. This is a stinking big deal that is really exploding all over the place. And you guys have probably seen this with um, like Facebook or Instagram, a lot of people are submitting like 40 of their own images um, and they put it through an app like Lensa or something like that. And it will then generate 
several different varieties of poses, um, different kind of tones and everything. And they actually turn out like somebody sat there, like you commissioned a painting from the 1800s. Like you were some kind of noble and you sat down for a painting and got painted. And uh, the detail on it is pretty incredible. And and like Amy said, it's kind of the implications of it are kind of terrifying, especially when we're kind of grappling with uh, already with privacy issues and everything like that. Uh, and and as Dave mentioned, deep fakes, the implications of this are are kind of um, it's a blessing and a curse, right? To have all this yeah. at our fingertips, but also the curse is how do you control it? And the answer is you really don't. So, yeah, the. I think this is one of those moments in time where you're it's like watching history in slow motion because you know that it's going to be a turning point for the depth of basically just sin. Like that's just the short way to put but the amount of like fraud and issues. So for instance, even just a quick example, um chat gpt is open source it's free you can go online so um when it sort of exploded people were going in and they were asking it questions like uh what are some of the biggest security vulnerabilities in banks or like uh, those kinds of questions because it's because basically what chat gpt is is the smartest research tool that exists right now and so it's like quick research and it was giving back people very very dark seedy information they didn't need to be having um and so the chat gpt that the developers had to instantly put a ton of parameters on it and it's already not as smart as it was simply because they were starting to freak out at the kind of information people were gathering but i do think that it's probably long overdue to have something that is helping us to manage the amount of information on the internet in a way that's smart I mean, what it comes down to really is that right now, the smartest thing up until now that we had to organize the information and content on the internet was Google. <laughs> we had to, by hand, search the best terms we could come up with. And and on the other side, we had to anticipate what people were searching. Uh, and then you have to go click through click, article by article, to try and get some answers. And so ChatGPT, I think, is just the very beginning of us seeing new ways of people accessing the interface, information that we're building. And it really begs the question, how do we respond to that? How do we as businesses sort of pivot and manage this kind of change, not only utilize it internally, but also to the fact that people are going to start accessing information on the internet um, the World Wide Web, like in a very different, much smarter way. You know, I want to share something really quick. This is actually, so uh, just to give you an example of kind of the quality of what's happening, Ogilvy, which is a big um, agency, and Nestle, they took a very famous painting by Vermeer called The Milkmaid, and they expanded it for their purposes. And so I want to show you what they built. So this is what they created this painting. And so the original Milkmaid by Vermeer, a, you know, a masterpiece, was only this center section where the lady is pouring the milk. The rest of this piece of art mirrors Vermeer's um, style, quality, you know, uh, I think to my eye exactly, which is not a very trained eye, but you can see it added all of the rest of this content and that was all done with AI. Now, this this particular painting took it took one thousand instructions, but compare the one thousand text instructions to create this to what it would have taken an actual painter or graphic artist to create something of similar value. So there is a bit of you know a little bit of to use Alvin Toffler's term, a little bit of future shock going on, mm -hmm. in which people are looking at like what th what this can do. Uh, and there's been a lot of dire predictions and kind of fear around this. And I think there's good reason for that. Um, I will tell you that already right now, this kind of generative AI is already outpacing the capacity for kind of the, the legal 
trademark and copyright monitoring systems to even catch up at all. Um, I sat on Dolly today for a half hour and I created, I probably created um, 50 images in a half hour using just simple text instructions. And I'm no artist and you know anyone who sees what I did, you can see what it looks like. Some of them are really cheesy. I tried to create a, I wanted to create a pinball machine that had Brussels sprouts as the little balls to give to Chad. I thought he would appreciate that. It didn't come out very good, <laughs> but I did create a little of a, um, a oil painting of a teddy bear um, wearing a pink dress and a party hat for my um, two lovely granddaughters. So anyway, I had some success there. I also created, I created a 3D, a 3D rendering of the word story uh, in our brand colors. I created the word story in a stained glass window using our brand colors. So, so it gives you an idea of what could be done by a, a basically untrained, unqualified artist as myself. So let's talk about the dire and gloom. I'm going to dive into it and then opportunities. <laughs> so so what this is going to, going to do is put a lot of people out of jobs. And I'm not, I mean, this is, there's no stretch of the imagination when it comes to this, right? If, if a computer's writing all this stuff for you, like, like what, what are, is art going to look like in, in, you know, by 2030? I mean, will, will artists like on DeviantArt and, and, uh, all these other places, will they have jobs after this? Will they get commissioned works? Probably not. Like I'm even considering this now. Like I have I have a book to illustrate. Like maybe I should just use Dolly and see what it comes up with, right? So like that that brings like implications of how how many people are going to be displaced by this, right? And you know, is it are people going to then pivot to becoming AI uh, talkers for 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 lack of a better term? Like are there going to be people who know a algorithm so well they can kind of spin it and they can give it concise yet clear instructions like the thousand instructions that it took to make that painting will people be able to grab those as like kind of like requirements and say okay you have to do it this way i don't know well that's already happening chad i mean that's already happening people are becoming i call them ai jockeys but they're you know they're people who are they're learning to use the ai they're being used in large companies but not just for content creation, for all kinds of stuff. But that is going to become a new job and it won't replace all the, well, and by the way, the writing jobs are already on the rocks anyway, because newspapers and, and magazines have gone in the tank, right? So the writers were already looking for something else to do. I'm not sure that's that's a big doom and gloom because that was already that was already in the works, I think. But there's a lot of other examples probably. Um, but I, I just wonder about the offset, you know, is there going to be, are there going to be new jobs created as a result? My question. Yeah. So, I mean, you're already saying AI jockeys. I mean, I think it's probably going to go beyond that where they can, they know the algorithm intimately. They can say, okay, here's, here's how this works. Here's how we get it to optimally spit out what you need. Ask it, what, what are the implications of chat GPT for, for writers? Ask it how it, how chat GPT will become Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> will do. Then let me my next one. So when Dave was, uh, Dave and I were playing with this a few days ago, one of the things he did is he asked about a company, but he, he named the company wrong. Like it wasn't just a misspelling. It was like a completely wrong brand name for the company. But chat GPT corrected it and knew exactly who he meant to say and then wrote about that company. It was crazy. <laughs> I think it was Dollar Shave Club. I think you called it um, <laughs> some kind of like shave group or something. Like it was just, it was just very off, but it knew. That's crazy. So this is from a single, single short query. Hmm. So its answer is it'll more likely be for augmentation rather than replacement. Okay. Well, hmm. so Chad, bring it on. Some more doom and gloom. <laughs> now I will tell you. Here's here's a great segue to doom and gloom. I will tell you. Please read what it spits out because I we've used it with a couple of our clients that have very specialized certifications, and they got them wrong. So just just keep that in mind. They basically yeah. said mm -hmm. the governing body was uh, this three letter uh, acronymed uh, federal government entity, which was actually not even close. 
Well, well the other I, thing to note is this is not a timely AI. It, it has everything up until 2019, 2020. So AI has not 2021. So it hasn't AI hasn't met up with real time. Like we're not searching real time. And so part of that, uh, Chad, could have just been that certifications have been updated and changed since then. I know you guys are 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 advocates for this, but I'm telling you, I'm not to to, I, to I'm go just trying to this, respond to it. To go in this with a grain of salt and read the work that it gives you. That's what I'm trying to tell our our listeners and viewers. Oh yeah, here. absolutely. You mentioned is it is it valiant or not? And we've talked before on this podcast about the implications of technology and them kind of like technology. Um, furthering the hand of mammon, which is the ability to make money without human connection. And to me, this is just, it's on the same wave of everything else that takes away what it means to be human. It doesn't mean you can't be creative using this tool, and it doesn't mean that we won't try to utilize this tool to speed up our ability to, you know, develop content and whatever else we can do with it. Um, but man, as this begins to replace human connections, as it begins to take us out of our email, like this kind of tool at some point probably will be used to respond to people's emails over a long period of time, over a lot of topics without a person ever having to get involved. Um, certainly, we're already doing it with chats on websites, but there's an endless amount of examples there where we're we're reducing human interaction and human connection. And that for me is probably the largest concern is like, how are we taking away what it means to be human and how are we keeping each other, keeping ourselves from each other um, in a way that God never, never intended, you know? And I do think that this is going to drive the, that hunger for human connection even more. Imagine sitting all day and being a being an AI jockey and talking to a computer and, and asking it to do things for you, which is no different than what they used to do with punch cards, you know? They would have big stacks of punch cards and drop them in the computer and the computer would do a thing for them. It's no different than that. It's just at a much higher level. But I do think it's really important to recognize how fast this is moving. This is moving really, really fast. We, I was on the call with a client uh, last week, and they unveiled a new thing they were doing. I, and I, I hope to bring them on our podcast. And actually, we will definitely prom- talk about what they're doing. I can't say what it is, but they have already put a platform on top of ChatGPT in which they are going to launch it live on their website. Um, within this month. And uh, when they told me, they said we'd do it in two weeks, maybe within a week. So this is stuff that's moving really, really, really fast. And, and these and these machines are learning from the interactions. Um, so this question is, write a story about how AI replaced a human in the voice of Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping on my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping on my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, this this is pretty long, right? So it's going to keep going forever. (laughs) I'm going to keep reading. With a clank and a hum, it began its work, and with nay a pause, performing tasks with efficiency and speed, leaving me in a daze. For what use is a man of letters when a machine can write with such grace? But alas, I knew my fate was sealed, and so I sat in my seat, watching as the machine of metal took my place complete. That's great. It's a great poem. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You should well, share that it, in the show notes. Yeah. Well, because it I ripped off the, the raven. Oh, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> of yes. course it did. Of course it did. Well, and that, that's the point, did. right? There, there has to be this creative input to get a creative output. Yeah. And, and someone has to plug the machine in. <laughs> and paper well, the power. It, <laughs> this and is a tool okay the same hammer that builds a house can also hurt someone boom Ooh. put that in your pipe and <laughs> smoke it that was very deep chad that was deep chad all right so i want to okay. talk about some practical stuff is that all right please so i i believe we are at a tipping point in the adoption of ai in our daily lives in many ways i think it's going to expand very very quickly um, and so here are some ways that kind of from the marketing and communication sales perspective, it can be used in a positive way. Um, it can be used for personalization. You can take things you already have and you can 
have them rewritten for, to be personalized. You can use it for research. You can get fresh ideas for content. You can get content generated faster. If you can get a list of problems, questions, issues, then it just speeds up your ability to interact and build out good content. You can use it to rewrite content. I did a test with a client's blog. I did it with Chad. We took a blog that was well-written and we asked Chad GTP to rewrite it and give us an alternative version. So in about five minutes, we had something that was about 2,000 words and it was very well-written and it could be used pretty close to the way it was. Um, and so I think that, you know, it is, it has use, useful applications. I think you also could do it to create original graphics. Now, they're not really original to you, I guess, uh, but they certainly would be appropriate for various things. I know, I think another application in the area of marketing is going to be the ability to test and iterate on ads. So using AI, you'd be able to test different permutations of an ad. Um, and you'd be able to create landing pages really, really quick and, and various emails and spin that out. And I think you'll see this in the ad space really fast. Um, people using this to, to get very scientific and quick about improving the quality of ads. I, I'm sure that it, it may already be being used by Google and Facebook on the back end, but th that gives them the power, not us. So those are some of the positive uses I, th I think that, that this will help with. Um, it will empower people that don't have access to, to big dollar writers to create maybe a little better content. It'll help a lot of college students to write essays that they didn't write on their own, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so isn't it, I, isn't I, it most college essays, though, to be honest? Anyways. <laughs> so I do think that there's some negative things that we need to talk about that relate to the brand. And I like, I like to quote Johnny Cash on this. I'm going to do my very best Johnny Cash impersonation. Here we go. Please I hear the train a coming. It's rolling around the bend. So I think, personally, I think this is a freight train that is going to impact brands, marketing, and businesses in very significant ways. I do not think we can stop it. I think it is already on the tracks. It's coming around the corner. And this, this stuff we were just talking about with chat G, GTP, GPT, is just the first installment of what is publicly coming out. Um, right now, about 1.1 trillion megabytes of data is being created every day. And the, the predictions are, prior to the release of this, the predictions were a 600% increase of data being created between 2021 and 2025. I think we're going to see that even go even higher. And so part of what you're going to see, just straight up, is a flood of content, a flood. Photos, videos, written content, and we already had kind of what's been called up until now. It's been called spinning, and there's been software for a while that will spin articles. It assembles sentences and paragraphs pretty awkwardly. It's been used by a lot of kind of um, I would call hack content creators who just want to fill up the internet with stuff that might rank or might get some links attached to it. So a lot of spinning's been going on, but now what we're going to see is a level of spun content or AI-generated content that is even, it's better, it's a lot better, and the volume's going to go through the ceiling. So I think one impact immediately is that if anyone's publishing, you know, halfway developed or low-quality written content online, you might, you honestly might as well stop. And I would have yeah. probably said that last year or year before, but now... You know, if you're just putting out junk, just stop because you're wasting your time. Uh, so the bar for volume is going to have to, the, the bar for quality and value is going to have to go way up. It was already pretty high. Um, and so I think that's one direct outcome from this is that junk content is going to be no more. There'll be a lot of it out there. Um, but I think that the algorithms like Google um, and other search engines are going to be able to kind of sort out the stuff that's low quality. If it can write it, it can also read it. And if it's if it's not high quality, you know, it's going to be able to parse that out pretty quickly. And as it sits today, you know, 90% of internet pages are not ever read. It's that 10% that have value, right? And that's what we have to target. And so what's going to happen is that's mm -hmm. going to become more competitive. And that's going to be one impact, I think. What do you guys think? You like my Speaking Johnny Cash? Speaking of uh, 
It was it was something. I hear uh, the train <laughs> coming. It's no. coming around the bend. <laughs> Speaking of competitive, I mean, what's going what's going to happen in the next couple of years is your competitors are going to use Jasper Chat Chat GPT. I can barely say that because a software developer made that name. Or a government employee, <laughs> but anyways, because they're trying to describe no the system they've made. No, just name it something sexy like Dolly, which they have. They're it's part of the same kind of framework. Anyways, competitors are going to come in, and they could be horrible. They could be not even somebody you consider a competitor, and just because they use this software, they're going to become your competitor. Okay, you're going to see, uh, and to bring back Dave's analogy about the college kids, you're going to see college kids who have no business competing with you, compete with you. So, so hey, hey, not all doom and gloom, right? You might see some of the top dogs being challenged <laughs> by by somebody, the next Elon Musk in his uh, mom's basement, and he's he's going to compete with you uh, in, in that same space, even though he has no business doing so. So that, that, Yeah, that that's was a, really the change sure, that I was going to mention is that just like with COVID, anytime the market's majorly disrupted, it can be, obviously there's a lot of negative implications and there's a lot of scary implications, but it sort of is a leveling thing. It levels everyone because it forces everyone to innovate and those who can innovate fastest are the ones who suddenly have a place in the market they could have never had without that market disruptor. Um, and so I think it is if you can like get on it and get ahead of it, um, or at least try to catch up with the train as much as possible because it's rolling, um, that could be a positive for... I, I think, you know, another challenge we're going to be facing is going to be just the ability of a competitor to spin up a, a competitive online presence. So like if I wanted to go to Richmond, Virginia, which is an hour from where we live, and I wanted to open a, a medical imaging facility, let's say, I could go, I could sample all of the medical imaging websites in the city. I could take my G chat GPT and I could rewrite all of their content, all of it. And I could put it back up in a brand new website I could also use analytics to identify the most valuable posts and do those first, add to them. And I could probably do that probably maybe in a day, maybe two days if I was really doing some real editing on it. Um, so you're going to see the ability of people that have a little bit of money and who know how to use these tools come in and be very competitive very quickly. So what it means for those existing incumbent providers in Richmond or anywhere else is that they are going to have to understand the nature of their competition is going to change. And that means they have to up their game. Um, and so, and I, and I think I know we're working on ways to help people up their game um, to be stay competitive, to be unique in the market. But I do think that's going to be a reality is that you're going to see this and it's already happening now, but not this fast and not this efficiently. It's more expensive right now. If, if I, in the absence of these, this kind of software, that task I just said would probably take a month or two months to do, um, to get someone to do that, even if you had writers and things like that. Um, and so I think there's going to be some really big changes in the, the way that we perceive it. And then what's going to happen is the search engines are going to have to respond to this. And they are going to become even more picky about you know the signals that they're sampling about usability, about custom interaction, about value. Um, and so the, you know, the value of what you do online is going to have to go way up and you're not going to be able to do, you know, schlocky stuff that is just kind of low quality because someone will just take your place in the market. Boom. Yeah, without question, this is this is why it matters more than ever to be intentional, have an actual brand, be clearly differentiated, like <laughs> yeah, all the things that um, we already believe in because it's those tiny differences that are going to make really set you apart um and i also think this is going to be an important moment to decide how are you going to not be behind the curve like but also where are you intentionally going to keep human interactions mm -hmm. people will get tired of emailing an ai people will get tired of 
of your website being full of information that no one on your team could ever provide on on the phone. <laughs> like being a fake provider of answers is also mm. going to happen and going to be a problem mm. because people are going to hire unqualified teams. So um, just all of those like authentic, you know, this is truly who we are, transparent human things are going to matter yeah. even more than they ever have before. And there's intentionality there too. And, and I think, you know, just imagine you're on a chat on a website. Are you going to know? Now, we already know we're talking to a bot because it asks, it asks these prefab questions. We know we're talking to a bot. But when it starts to actually have interactions and ask you questions and respond, and are you going to know if it's a human or an AI? You're not. Um, you know, the same thing's true with other kinds of communication, but the same thing with email. Are you, is it going to be an AI or is it going to be a person? And so I think there's going to be confusion on the part of people. And I think what's going to happen is, as you just said, Amy, I think that the value of human interaction is going to go back up. Um, and I think you're going to see people even more hungry for it than they are now. And if someone, if someone wants to live in, the, in their own AI world, I mean, how do you think the metaverse is going to get populated? How do you think it's going to get built and filled with fake people? It's going to all be AI. It's going to be filled. A whole universe. Just imagine a whole universe created by machines. It sounds like Tron, right? Mm -hmm. um, ex yeah, except it's got different different features, right? <laughs> or Ready it's, Player it's, One. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a whole universe of people. And if you want to get lost in that and just go hide yourself in an imaginary universe, you're going to be able to do it for sure. And you're already able to do a lot of that now, but it's going to get bigger and bigger and more expansive. And so I, I would just say from like a business leader perspective, like how are we going to help people not to get lost in that? How are we going to help them to anchor ah. their lives in relationships and in community and in reality, in a reality in which their lives are accountable, in which they're dealing with real people? I mean, at some point, you know, the, the business claims on websites are going to be Never talk to an AI, only real people here, you know, or something like that, because there's, they're going to be really wanting to di differentiate between what's fake and what's real. I also think we're going to see a ton more scammers um, and fakes and imposters across the board. So you, you're you going to have to become much more careful about who you do business with because you're not going to know if it's being generated by some kind of scammer in some other country who's just trying to get your phishing for your your financial information. Or it's a real person. And so it's going to become, and that will probably include phone calls. It will include videos. It will include text messages. It already does a lot of that, but that's not all being driven by AI now. That's just by clever people with a little bit of automation. So I think we're going to see that go up as well. Um, and that puts us in a position where businesses that are committed to relationships and building communities and creating trust, there are a lot of things. I was on a call this morning with a, a bunch of, of, uh, kind of Bible-believing, Jesus-following business leaders. And I was on a call with them. And, you know, the things that we shared together today were, like, really valuable. And they were really meaningful. And there is not a machine on the planet that could have done any of that. It, it, it wouldn't have mattered at all. And there's things that only people can share with people. Um, and, you know, I think we, you know, God put something in our hearts that's it's part of him. And machines can try and simulate it. And they can look and sound like it. But they aren't, they aren't the actual real McCoy. So we're going to have to help people um, not kind of be confused about all of that and, and offer them, I think, a real alternative for real life. That sounds like a sermon or something. Sorry. It's what we're all about over here. We can't help it. We just like humans, you know? <laughs> I, I tolerate to them. Humans. I love <laughs> I love the part of the, you know, I love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the, the neighbor as yourself part, that's the part that gets me in trouble usually. So anyways, just shared something. I, was being I didn't know the second half of that real. verse was blah, 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 but that's interesting. Blah, blah, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I could have quoted it. I just, I know people know it <laughs> by heart. Before we leave, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share. I've been putting in some inputs into Dolly so people could see kind of what you're talking <laughs> nice. about. Um, so I'll just share a few things that I want to see if I you created. did better than me. Do, I, do I, you have to have oh, an account I for that? Absolutely did not. No, it's free. You have to have an open AI account for any of their yeah, tools. I, so all you have to do is get one open AI account and it works for everything. It's free. Yeah. 
Mm. Um, so here's Dolly. Here's how that's spelled. D-A-L-L dash E. Um, I put in a human on the phone with a computer realism. You can see it took realism to be a lot of different kinds of realism. <laughs> this was the realism I actually meant over here on the right. Um, we have person lost in a sea of computers, digital art. These are all super cool. Those are cool. actually really cool. Yeah, Shang-Chi very Yoko. cool. These these are were generated in 60 seconds or less. Computer head sitting at a desk with another computer. Surreal. I like the Moai kind of inspired statue ones right there to yep. the right. Those are cool. I put line from the line, uh, the witch in the wardrobe, in the snow, Polaroid. Here's what came up. So you can see there's a, it's kind of, again, shocking. I'm like, oh, now I know what all of our blog images, all of our YouTube thumbnails, like, <laughs> how easy is it to suddenly have branded images of anything you can possibly imagine? Choose a style, choose a, choose, you know, a shtick for your brand and then generate anything you want in that same branded style. Done. It's crazy town. Done. Done. Well. So, the so you know, we ought to talk about what people should do about this, but I think we should save that for another episode. Don't you think? And if they wanted ah. to see that, if they want to see that episode, what the best thing they could do is probably subscribe. And that way, yep. they would be able to keep track of all the other really smart things <laughs> that you guys are going to say. That or you have a time machine. So you can go the next week, but nice. I we prefer that you subscribe. Yes. So if you are interested in our proven three-step growth system, we have a free one-hour masterclass. It's yours for the taking. It outlines how we do kind of brand story, all of these fundamental elements you have to have if you want to get on the chat GPT train and don't get lost in the sauce. Follow the link below and also subscribe. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you guys next week. Bye.